How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the LPM podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, comic cuts. Comic cuts have been uh, a really popular insert in recent Marvel products. Uh, Marvel Beginnings had a whole bunch of really interesting cuts coming from a whole bunch of different um, comic issues with a wide variety of characters. And we had to have a guest on to talk about these. There's lots of people that enjoy the comic cut insert. There's lots of people that think it's kind of crazy. And today we're gonna bring on a guest to talk about exactly this. Oh. There you are. What's going on, Dave? Sorry, I was just playing around with this scissor. Um, just cutting up some comics, right? <laughs> just cutting up some comics. <laughs> How you doing, Graydon? Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate you coming on. This is uh, it's funny. Like uh, comic cuts are the comic people must just roll over in their bed just thinking about these things. Where the Marvel card people are just so stoked on them. I love it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a very interesting polarizing thing, and I, I I almost think that there's a lot of people that don't know about it that are big comic heads that if they found out, um, right. you know, they would they would have uh, their torches aimed at the card companies. Right. So first things first, why don't you give us an introduction of who you are and where people can find you? All right. My name is Dave and I am the West Coast Avengers. Uh, I am a comic book collector, a seller, and I guess a historian. I have a YouTube channel under the name West Coast Avengers. You can find me doing live sales every other week and interviews with amazing comic book creators and uh, artists. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been collecting and reading comics since I was a kid and I sell them for a living for about the last two and a half, three years. Right on. Was this a COVID project of yours after COVID kind of thing? It was kind of after COVID. Yeah. I, uh, I was, uh, I was, I worked in the event industry and I used to work in the sports memorabilia industry. Um, COVID hit my job ceased to exist. I yep. became a uh, mail carrier and I started going to garage sales and um, estate sales on the weekend. I started buying collections and then I quit the post office and do this full time now. Interesting. I also got uh, laid off uh, during COVID. I was actually did a small stint working for a delivery company for a mail company as well. It lasted three weeks. <laughs> yeah, I lasted about a year and a half at the post office and uh, I sprained my back. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, American uh, government and healthcare system. And uh, yeah, here I am now as a comic book slinger. There you go, slinger. I like your slang. Um, yeah. what, what's your interest in Marvel cards? Do you collect Marvel cards? Are you interested in any kind of cards? I, I mean, as a kid in the 90s, I voraciously collected Marvel cards. I mean, I think I would buy boxes of almost everything that came out probably up until 96 Masterpieces because I think I clocked out right before those came out. Wow. Um, and then when I started buying comic collections, if somebody had a card collection, there's a shelf with a bunch of collections up there. I would just take them and, you know, sell uh, and, you know, grade some. I love the art of breaking boxes. Like I enjoy ripping into boxes because it, it, it it's still fun to me. Um, but I'm, I wouldn't call myself a collector of cards as much as I would have in the nineties. Do you have any binders right now in your household? of, uh, of cards? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've got six or seven on a shelf up there. Nice. So if you've broken some boxes, can you tell us what's the most exciting card you've ever pulled? I pulled, uh, I can't remember the set, the Wolverine, uh, the Spider-Man Venom hologram was at 95, Fleer Spider-Man, that, that really tough one to find. Nice. Uh, what, do you remember what color it was? I think there's a couple variations of colors for those holograms. Might have been blue. Oh, that is been, very cool. Yeah. And then I've ripped a bunch of high-end Star Wars boxes, the Masterworks, and I Fun. pulled a Mayhew on-card Chewbacca autograph, which was really cool to pull. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's still fun. Like I said, ripping into boxes, I'll never get tired of it. So much fun. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in recent, you know, the recent sets, I didn't bother with masterpieces because it's, it's high end and it's not worth it. I, you know, the midnight sunset was really cool because a buddy of mine, uh, Way Shack did a, some of the most killer art in that set. Uh, midnight suns has got some really great reviews from people in the hobby. Yeah, I think because the original art and the tone of the art, it really just hits for those characters. 
I think that Midnight Suns was also one of um, the less popular storylines. I think people yeah. were a bit surprised to see that get a, a dedicated set and got a reminder of how awesome the Ghost Rider story is. It, it's you're right. It, it's almost like they took a cult favorite and and yeah. went mainstream with it, and it was it was good. I think as much as I don't agree with what the card companies do, especially uh, you know Upper Deck, yeah. that might have been one of the best choices that they've made uh, in recent memory. Uh, you know, it's uh, I, I'm I'm interested to hear you say that a lot of people would agree with you. So today we're going to talk about comic cuts. Can you give people who are watching that might not know what a comic cut is an idea of what a comic cut is? All right. Well, for example, you would take a comic like a Frank Miller Daredevil 180, and you would find like the most meaningful page in it. And um, when I say the the card company will cut out the page, they will cut it up into swatch swats swatches, and they will. Put them on a card and number them uh and that's what a comic cut is it's taking a piece of a comic and putting it on a card um i don't like it <laughs> <laughs> so when you say it's numbered if you see a comic cut are they frequently numbered out of 40 does that mean they cut up 40 pages 40 different books if it's numbered out of 40 i would assume it's i don't know actually to tell you the truth i don't i don't know because going on the ASM 300 cover that they did, that Justin got, how, I don't remember. Is that 18 cards? They cut it up and numbered it? Uh, I thought it was nine. but uh, Nine. Okay, yeah, yeah. Three, three. Yeah, yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah. So that's what I would assume, but I don't know how you number a comic cut out of 40 if the piece is this big and the page is this big. I've always wondered myself. I don't have the answer to that either. Yeah, yeah. It's a, um, it's a tactic that dates back to sports cards it actually you know the idea of a comic cut comes from i would say the early 90s whenever um the company started doing game use jersey and game use stick cards for hockey um yeah. they would cut up a jersey and that that's really the worst because they were <laughs> they were taking here we go uh, this will really strike a chord with you being a canadian they, I think they took one of Gretzky's Canada jerseys and they cut it up and he only wore like three or four jerseys at, in the Canada cup that year. That Jersey no longer exists as a Jersey. Yeah. As it a Jersey. ceases to be. And that's a piece of sports history. And with a comic, the real disservice isn't just the cutting of the comic. You are taking somebody's art yeah. and the way a comic page is designed. It is, you know, the original art is uh, 11 by 17 or whatever. That's not meant to be like, it's not meant to have the panels cut into little pieces. Those panels are made to be seen as pieces of art, panel to panel to panel to make a story. Right. And so what, what you're doing, you're taking Spider-Man's leg from a, a, an AF-15 and you're bastardizing it on a card? Fuck that. Right. I got you. I got you. So why do you think, well, do you think that comic cuts are becoming more popular in the Marvel world? It seems that they are because I'm starting to see it more and more people. And, and, and look, I'm not trying to shit on somebody's enjoyment of it. Yeah. But you have to understand, you know, as people buy into these more and more, the prices go up because values go up. You know, that's how collectibles work these days the more people that post that comic cut and other people see it the more the fomo sets in like oh i gotta get a box i gotta try and get one of these comic cuts or i gotta put together the whole page by the time you put together that whole page you could have had four copies of that book so that's one of the questions i've had so there are people that are collecting comic cuts and trying to get the page or the issue or whatever and it's, it, it seems really it, it's interesting to me that why wouldn't you just go out buy the comic and own the whole thing well and that's therein lies the hook of the card companies have on the community you know that it's it's the chase i get it it's the chase you want to rip boxes but yeah you, you know even if you're not ripping boxes to get these cards and you're you're going out on ebay by the time you get to that last card that you yeah. need to buy to complete that that price is going to be astronomical because you're not the only person that's probably trying to get it. Right. So you know. I very rarely give my opinion on the podcast about inserts or whatever the topic is, because we're here to ask you, but it's interesting because I like the comic cuts, 
Right. I think that they're I think that they're a really cool thing to collect as a character collector. I haven't gone into the world of trying to collect a whole page, but I completely sympathize with the comic world thinking this is insane. So I'll give you yeah. an example. So you, you brought up the Wayne Gretzky jersey. Personally, something I've collected for years are skateboards. So I, okay. I skateboarded uh, as a kid, as an adult, as an adolescent, and uh, I've collected almost every deck I ever skated in unskated condition and had them hung on the wall. My character mm. collect in skateboarding is Chad Muska. Ooh. So the so I have I have an amazing array of red Chad Muska decks from shorties and from reprints and from decks that he's released. And if someone were to take an original shorty board and cut it up into small pieces, number them and sell them off, I would lose my mind. <laughs> I would lose my mind. So I completely right. sympathize with the comic world in, uh, in in your feelings about comic cuts. Yeah. And, and even setting it aside of like destroying the actual comic, the, the, the disservice done to the art and the artist is really what bugs me. It's like, fuck do you want spider-man's leg for that yeah. todd McFarlane drew when you can literally for you know let's say one of those cards like a, a McFarlane. let's say okay let's take the last page of asm 299 first full page splash of venom an amazing image chasing a piece of that page just because upper deck put it on a card and put their stupid logo on it yeah what like it, it doesn't make sense to me when you can't enjoy the actual art. And if you can't enjoy the art of a comic, why are you, why do you care about comics? Right. Because why that's is all it is. It's words and pictures. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the comic cover cutups are EPAC achievements. So they're adding an element of rarity to where you have to not only chase the comic cut, but you're chasing the achievement by collecting the other product. It's very yeah. much, it's, it's really a, it's an item to buy, right? Yeah. They call that a money grab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I, I understand the idea of the hunt and the chase, but it's not organic. Nothing about it is organic. It is all um, manufactured scarcity. You know, I, yeah. I look, I look at what I do. I hunt books, not just at comic stores, not just at flea markets or estate sales but I buy collections. Mm -hmm. That hunt is tangible. I don't know what I'm going to get myself in front of, and I have the choice to spend the money or not. Whereas EPAC, you're just blindly throwing money at this company, hoping you're getting a thing. You know, with the packs, at least ripping a box, you're getting something tangible. But right. EPAC to me is like even the, it's, it's disrespectful to the consumer. I, you know, on that, on that topic, I mean, I agree with you to an extent. I can't believe there's digital cards and they're yeah. charging they charge for it. So in, in having, yeah, in having these products to buy and there's digital cards and Marvel beginnings in this most recent set that came out, the, uh, the Fleer throwback. Yeah. It's very odd. It's very, it, very, it odd. is. And, you know, and with these comic cuts, it's just, <clears throat> they're giving people manufactured scarcity, right? Like I said, they're doing a disservice to the comic book medium, to the comic book itself. Um, but if you chase, let's say for you, you're you're a saber tooth guy. Yeah. Let's say there was a new, you know, in Midnight Suns, they threw the comic cuts of the first appearance, you know, the first page that uh that Sabretooth is on on Iron Fist 14, and you spend six grand going after that to get the whole page. Right. You could have had you could have had. 15 copies of that book in 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 any condition you want raw at that price uh for six thousand dollars you could have probably bought not a page from that book but you could have bought maybe an original page with saber tooth on it drawn by an artist that you actually like you know maybe like right. mark texier or something like that or silvestri because you're not getting that john Byrne uh page of saber tooth for under 10k at least uh, but yeah i just look at it this way and i'm like Cards have a, a weird hold on people and there's not a lot that you can like, you can't voice your opinion about cards and upper decks going to listen. They just don't a hundred percent, you know, and you're spending 100%. so much money on, on this product to get maybe a piece of a comic. That's, <laughs> that, that's the thing that blows my, you can't have the whole thing in a piece on a card that we put on there with a serial number 
So you want it. Yeah. You want it. So there are there are comic inserts from Sabretooth's first appearance. And uh, and I have gone after some of them. I own some of them. I'm still going after some of them. But in these conversations I have with people such as yourself, I find myself questioning, why is this insert important to me? Right, right. And it isn't important to me as a set collector because I collect sets. Sure. I have them in my binders. I love it. And I'm not looking to complete this insert from the set collecting point of view. I'm looking at it because my character is on it. So I'm not trying to justify this, uh, this posting sure. of your guys' hobby, but the only reason I'm interested in them is because Sabretooth is on them. Like, you know, I've bought cups from 7-Eleven because Sabretooth was on it. So buying a comic cut is just one more of that insane thing that I'm after. You know what I mean? I do, I do. And look, I get it. You know, I, I collected hockey cards for a decade, two decades, and I was a player collector. You know, I collected Jeremy Roenick and I collected at Belfour and Pat LaFontaine. So, so I get it. But to me, there wasn't anything, there was nothing about it that I felt like I was being taken advantage of. Most, none of the cards would ever really double up on the same images. Um, and they're real people. So there's multiple ways to have yes. them on cards. And, you know, if I had one autograph card from like, be a player, of of Roenick. That was good. That was good. Right. I didn't need every single one that he signed. Um yeah. and with character character collecting, I get it. I love it. I think, you know, why do we love comics? Because of characters. Yes. But they take advantage of us. They repurpose art. They throw serial numbers on there. They throw pieces of their legs and a comic cut on there. You know, and 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 it's just like as a collector, you know, we we all share that brain right we all collect differently but we all share the same you know maybe it's a malfunction it's something in our personality that just <clears> makes <throat> us feel better because we're we're collecting this stuff but i just feel like as a collector the the, the comic card space gets taken advantage of uh more than the comic space itself they're an easy target yeah yeah and you know holding these you know and I, I don't know what the comic cuts were in masterpieces, if there were any. There were there weren't any. Okay. Yeah. That that set was like the icing on the cake for me. But like I am never gonna go back into cards after that set came out because it was it was a money grab. It was um the one percenters were the only people that could afford boxes. Yeah. You know, the hype was not worth what everybody had, you know. It's interesting the price point difference from earlier masterpieces. Yeah. To that set and just for the record i have rainbowed the hell out of Sabretooth <laughs> from the 2020. i have spent a fortune collecting this set um in, in regards to my character but yeah. the other sets you know the 2018 uh, and the 2020 were drastically different in price for boxes very very and you know and you you know like you know your means right if you can afford it you can collect it and that's fine like mm -hmm. You know, one of the biggest rules that I, I think is, I think the biggest rule of collecting anything is collect within your means. Because yeah. if you ever have to worry about selling all that stuff and, you know, your life falls to pieces because you spend all these money on cards and you can't make your money back, you know, yeah. that's that's the, the tricky situation. But I don't know, like the comic cuts thing, I understand, you know, like from a standpoint of selling, marketing, cards existing, I understand why they exist. I do not agree with them because beyond destroying a comic book, you are doing a disservice to the art the, and the artist and the art of storytelling by cutting these pieces up and forcing people to be like, oh, well, I only have his leg and his, you know, the left quadrant of his face. So yeah, I'm, still, I'm still going for his crotch. I'm still. Yeah. To... Yeah. Yeah. The crotch, the abdomen, I need it all. And, you know, it just, it, it breeds, uh, I think, long-term contempt eventually from the collectors because on the back end, people are going to be stuck with a lot of these things that, you know, unless they truly are taking them to the, re you know, like the grave, like right. who's going to so want to you don't see a resale value holding its value in the future is what you're saying. No, I don't because yeah. how like they're just going to keep bastardizing these comics until there's just a bunch of crotches hanging out on eBay that nobody wants. So this is a great segue into our next uh, portion of this conversation. So many of these comic cuts are incorrectly labeled. 
are they? So there's a massive portion of, uh, and I do mean like, I mean a lot of air cards in Marvel Beginnings where somebody has just recently, I'm not going to share who it was. If you want to go do your undetective work out there on the internet, you can find this person's Instagram account. It's really interesting. I just don't know the person, so I don't want to. I don't sure. want to put him on the spot, him or her on the spot. But they published a list and they did their own homework. And an incredible number of them are not of the issue that is labeled on the pack. And to bring that one step farther, there have been, and not just from beginnings, from other sets that have been um, graded where the grading company caught that it was a reissue. It wasn't the original issue. That I've heard about. Yeah, that it's a... Personally, from the conversation we're having where people are, such as yourself, are upset that these comics are getting cut up, cut the reprints. Cut yes. those up. Those should be the ones in comic clippings. 100%. 100%. So as a huge fan of comic clippings, if they only cut up the reprints, which look better, they don't look like the vintage ones, right? And mm-hmm. it kind of settles the settles it for everybody. I would way rather see the reprints be cut up and pull those. They hold the same value because I'm looking at the number on the back, not the issue, personally. So I just I just want to throw that out there to the world that Upper Deck has horribly mislabeled these things. Horribly. And that just goes to show that they're, you know, they, they are the company that we all thought they were. They're not, you know, they don't know much. Um, I agree with you. Cut up, you know, like I can go through, I literally could sit here for 25 minutes going through, all right, this is the version that you should cut up of AF15. This is the version you should cut up of X-Men number one, GSX. Right. They're easy. Yeah, it's easy to do. You yeah. would still have the same manufactured scarcity. So yeah. in the the in the context of breaking a box, ripping packs, it would still be hard to find. And yeah, I don't think anybody would be like, oh, this, this Amazing Spider-Man 1 is actually a Marvel Tales reprint. I don't want it. You know if what? It's knew that it was. You, there are that. people that would be upset about that. But yeah, I yeah. Wrong. Yeah, I, I mean... And and it, did I hear? I feel like Manu was talking about it, or somebody was talking about it that they claim to have cut up high grade copies of these books. I know, so I've heard this as well. I don't know that for a fact. That's again, that's something I've just heard in hearsay. But I've always wondered, like, are they like, well, you know what? Why don't we get a low grade one because we're not going to use the cover, and you're not going to see the edges. It would just make so much sense. But in this world of collecting, the 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 making sense route doesn't often happen, right? Well, I mean, even if they're claiming that they're buying high grade books, business decisions get made to make companies money. If yes. you're looking at, I'm going to buy this thirty five thousand dollar three five AF fifteen, or I'm going to buy this purple label one zero for yeah. a a sliver of the price. We know which one they're buying. And that's what they should be doing. If they're going to bastardize these books, take Agreed. the lowest grade copies that you can get. Agreed. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's it, Yeah. And, and again, I can't speak to that being uh, hearsay. For, that's just hearsay for myself about them buying good grades or whatever. I've heard this rumor as well, but I've never heard anything concrete from a company about it. Um, yeah. That's another thing. Comic cuts seem to be a little bit of a mystery. Yeah. Like, yeah. <clears throat> there's a lot of, I know a lot less than I know for fact about comic cuts. Well, that's because there's no transparency with 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 Upper Deck. They, right. they have almost less transparency than CGC, which is really hard to come come by. <laughs> so, with, with with there being this ambiguity and this lack of communication and issues with missing hits and receiving a hit, quote unquote, from another series, yeah. you guys go through this in in the comic book world. You guys have issues with companies who are your main oh, yeah. provider in the collection in the, in the collecting world, right? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, CGC, there's no uh, shortage of dirty laundry to air about that company. And, you know, even the comic sellers, like the people that do these exclusives and variant covers, it's all it's all circus, you know, like uh, the flea circus. You know, John Hammond in Jurassic Park talking about the flea circus in that one scene. That's the comic community at large. And That's it's the going back in age there, but yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. I hope our yeah. viewers do as well. Yeah, well, I mean, look, if you haven't seen Jurassic Park, you need to turn this off real quick and go watch one of the greatest movies of all time. (laughs) Please come back when you're done. Yeah, 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 yeah. And hit the like button. Uh, It's it's really it's really hard to navigate um, the world of uh, of buying something authentic today. I think that actually we're living in the age where it is the hardest to find something authentic because there are so many services trying to sell you something. 
Mm -hmm. And there's so many people telling you, oh, you know, uh, oh, you should buy this, this, you should, you should do this with your books, you do this with your cards and grade this and do that. And it's, you know, it, it becomes, I'm sure, you know, for somebody, for anybody that's not super initiated and, and, you know, like I, I'm a veteran of doing this, so I don't, but I still have to kind of think twice before I do certain things. I can't imagine what it's like to be navigating this as, you know, a rookie you know, right. or, or, or even just kind of like a couple years in, um, because you're right. There's just a lot of people trying to sell you a lot of stuff. And then, you know, we, we're friends with a lot of this community, you know, in, in yeah, the car absolutely. Community. Um, but that doesn't absolve people from, you know, doing things to hype and, and, and create FOMO. And, right. you know, a lot of people in this space, whether it's cards or comics, um, really need to disclaimer their stuff with, buy within your means, you know, collect what you love is a great thing to say, but if you don't know what you love, you need to, you need to kind of discover these things before you start going crazy and going all in, like buying every Venom card or buy, buying every Miles Morales or Sabretooth card, because yeah. you can turn around and you spent 10 grand and what do you have to show for it? Five cards, 10 cards, right. you know, you know, yeah. just because they're serial numbered. Oh, I spent well, a lot of money on it. You know, that's a, it's, a, it's a great point to bring up. And that's part of the reason that we're doing this podcast. So on this podcast, we've been helping people who are newer to the hobby understand different aspects of the hobby. So we've done previous mm -hmm. ones about EPAC. We've yeah. done previous ones about putting a binder together. One's about graded cards. And you're right. If you get more information about it before you start deciding how heavily you want to go into a collection, you can kind of get an idea of what your involvement's going to be. I'm not going to talk to you about your budget, but what your level of involvement, like being a master collector of anything, like if you needed to have every comic that it had the Hulk in it, I can yeah. imagine you're being on a huge undertaking, but if you have the information beforehand and kind of knew what you were getting yourself into, that was a conscious decision. It'd be more enjoyable. Sure, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you're doing something like that, you just need to know that like there's the peak of the mountain being and we're talking about we'll just take the hulk for example the peak of the mountain is hulk one through six yeah. but then you've got you know your hulk 181 which is your first wolverine which is probably the second most sought after hulk comic and uh you know so so yeah you, you need to kind of do a little research start cheap you know unless unless you're a guy that can just throw money in a fire start cheap right. you know <clears throat> start all and you know there's a lot of people in both spaces, comics and, and cards, um, that are really great people to listen to. I mean, you know, if I took myself out of, out of my relationship with Manu, you know, Manu's really good at kind of being very honest and open and truthful about these things. And, you know, you know, you need people like that instead of, Oh, I'm just ripping 40 boxes of this. No big deal. And you go to buy one box and it's your entire paycheck. And this person's ripping 40 of them. I think that's one of the great services of these YouTube channels, though, is that so I'm not ripping 40 boxes, but I do love going to people's channels and watching them rip because quite frequently that's my Friday night. I'm sure. 37 years old. I'm married. I'm not that exciting at the end of that day on Friday. <laughs> and, and I really do like sitting down and watching them, opening them up. So and I, and I appreciate those channels greatly for doing that. But I understand what you're saying as well, where that doesn't set necessarily a realistic bar for everybody. Sure, you can live vicariously through some of these people. I mean, look, I get it from from my channel. I I went, you know, I'll go out and buy ten thousand dollar collection from somebody, but I'll, I'll be very transparent. This is how much I paid for it. I may not win, right? You know, um, and again, no, what? It's a gamble. gamble. Yeah. yeah, and nobody. I've never heard from anybody like, oh, Dave, I just went and bought a collection because I saw you do it, and I got jack shit. And now I'm out 10 grand. Nobody has ever said that to me because yeah. I think, you know, I try to set realistic expectations with people because I have to make my money back. Um, and, it, and it should be that like responsibly people should be doing that when they're talking about these cards, because you know what it's like to go out and buy some of these cards, but you're doing it within your means. You're not sometimes <laughs> yeah, well right sure we all do we all spend you know i i go on heritage sometimes and i'm like i want this piece of art and i'm not going to stop bidding until it's mine <laughs> you know there there are times in the card world where since things are numbered and i know i know that it's a different numbering system in um in comics where you're you're buying grades a lot of people sure 
But like, you know, sometimes it comes up so people know, like I'll, it'll come up where there is a out of 10 saber tooth that'll come up. Yeah. And I am not in a great position to be buying that card, but I don't know if it's ever going to come up again. And I, I sometimes extend myself that, you know, so just so everybody knows, like I, I do the same thing, but yeah. you do have to be careful. You, you really yeah. do have to be careful depending on where you're, where you're at. Right. And manufactured scarcity does that to people because does. there's, you it know, really like does. there's scarcity in the comic world, but you know, it, I don't know what the actual print run of ASM one was, but I'm sure it was in the hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, million, because it was on every newsstand in the country. Right. Um, and so the scarcity of that is a little bit easier to like digest because it's not that scarce, but you're right. And, and that's the biggest problem I think I have with cards. It's like, you know, you're sitting there and all of a sudden right on your, your screen on eBay, here goes that card. It's going. It's going. It's the yeah. only one of that number. And and it's like, do you really need it? No. Do you want it? Yes. But if, I don't know. I just, I, I think the cards has gotten so out of hand and it, it predates Marvel cards. Like I remember, and this, you know, we can, we can keep with the hockey, uh, you know, the, the hockey allegory, but when Crosby's first year, you know, his, his rookie year, that SP authentic autograph rookie card was numbered and that was it. You know, it's the same with Kobe, uh, LeBron. You know, he has these numbered uh, autograph or SP rookie cards. And it's like, that's really the beginning of the manufactured, manufactured scarcity. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Something, something to add to this conversation uh, about comic cuts. And I was mentioning that a lot of them are mislabeled. We've had conversations about these companies being um, less than transparent about it. Sure. It's, it's upsetting to me that um, my mm. main source for buying these cards is EPAC. Yeah, and it EPAC is the um, the platform brought to you by Upper Deck, who's producing yep. the product. I would expect if I went to Nike's website to buy a pair of Nikes, that a pair of Reeboks wouldn't show up, right? So for for myself on the topic, I know that in the comic world, you guys have had a number of conversations about uh, issues going on in that hobby at the moment. We have similar issues in Marvel cards and people seem to be very okay with it. And that's shocking to me. Shocking. Well, that's, that's the power that upper deck has because they're the only ones putting this product out. And so they, whatever they do, everybody just, they ate, look, no offense to anybody in the card community, but y'all, no yeah. but y'all are eating a fucking shit sandwich and coming back for seconds. You know, my dad, you know? Told me young kid actually that life is like a shit sandwich the more bread you got the shit you eat <laughs> there, you, there you go <laughs> i mean but that's really what i see it's like we're gonna bend you over and and, and you're gonna come back for more i agree that the 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 marvel car world needs to be so much more critical about mislabeled items yeah that are coming from a monopoly yeah and bad you know bad correlation and boxes and the fact that you know there's people that talk out there about how people are able to weigh boxes and this is how they do it. You know, like Coming upper, up, deck, up, <laughs> upper deck can take some of these millions of dollars they're making yes. and maybe just work on their, you know, quality control. And it's one of the biggest things that, you know, is plagued and, and is always in my head. And it's, you know, at large, it's just the corporate, you know, the corporate system that we live in, in, in this world. But it's the way that these collectible corporations just take advantage of everybody every single day. And nobody wants to say, or, you know, say something about it, stop yeah. buying, you know, yeah. rally up the troops and say, no, you know what? We're not going to buy any of this product and we're not going to buy it from David Adams and the three places that sell, you know, all this stuff. No, we're not. We're just right. not. And you know what would <laughs> happen? What would happen? Nobody would be able to like upper deck would just be like, okay, we have to do something because this isn't working for us. All it would take is one product to to tank yeah. would change their minds about how they approach it. Interesting. I uh they've been pumping out material lately like crazy. Yeah. And I'm shocked at the response that people have to it um based on the product. Like, so let, let's use masterpieces for example. It looks like my 10-year-old niece was in charge of quality control <laughs> on, uh, on Masterpieces. So this is the most expensive product that you can buy. 
the censuring on those cards i've seen cards on ebay going for uh, for for high prices and yeah. i'm like i can't even believe you would allow that to be that should be that should be thrown out that yeah. how that even made it into a pack is beyond me i mean and it it goes back to you know the early days of of at least in the marvel card space of like quality control just wasn't there i mean look at you know look at 90 you know marvel universe and look at spider-man metal that's the worst shit i've ever opened in my life it's crazy how good some of it is like anime was done in japan the cards yeah. are spectacular they're they're beautiful yeah they, they they've got their stuff dialed in you know midnight it's... suns i opened up on video on this channel if you go through some of my other videos you'll find my midnight suns box break with uh, william and justin mm. one of my corners came out it looked like i used it as a boomerang that didn't come back <laughs> Like, you know, and that, like, how, like, I work in an industry where if you don't provide a level of service, yeah, like, it, it comes up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're limiting this stuff, you know, right. it'd be one thing if it was an endless supply, it was like, you know, it was like cards in the nineties where the supply just never ran out, but this is specifically limited to X amount. And, you know, I, I don't know why people aren't speaking up about it that, buy a lot of this stuff because right there, if you're there ripping, be way if you're, more of a conversation going on there. yeah if you're ripping 10 15 boxes you are a percentage like you know i mean justin's channel they opened enough probably to say that they opened five percent of the print run interesting it i've never means, thought about the number but yeah like think about it if there's only forty thousand boxes and these guys ripped or whatever four thousand box i don't know what the numbers are but there were a lot of boxes ripped on that channel and um, that's an actual percentage, you know, if, if, the, you know, it's just like, if I own, if there's like some variant cover, that's 200, you know, there's only 200 made and I own 30 of them. I own an actual physical percentage of those books, you know? And so, you know, just what, to play, uh, just to play devil's advocate really quickly, Justin was one of the people that has commented on sure. some of the ambiguity that was going on as a result of being the person that opened a lot of that product and catching on to some patterns that were going on. Yeah, so yeah. I, I would actually, I, I would like to give a little bit of credit to him for pointing out some of those things. Cause I learned through those openings that there were some major issues going on. No, Justin, Justin did point that out. I I've got nothing but love for Justin. And no, hundred percent. I just want to make sure that, 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 you know, that the conversation that I hoped would have come up with the amount of boxes that got opened did come yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. But there's other people that are on his channel that won't, won't say anything, you know, that have opened up boxes <laughs> with him, you That's know, true. Yeah. and I'm, I'm not one of those people that, you know, you know, me and Manu, we don't, we're not the quiet ones. We're not the ones that are going to sit there and be like, yeah, we'll take it. We'll take it. No. <laughs> I think the comic world right now, especially with what's going on there is a lot more willing to stand up and be like, holy smokes, something is very wrong here where I'm not sure why that isn't the case in the Marvel world. I think it's, I, I think it is a bit of a FOMO thing. I, I mean, I don't even sure. like that word to describe it, but I think there are people and I'm, I'm included in that group where I'm like, you know what, if I don't pick up that saber tooth card, even though it's labeled wrong, another collector is going to, I'm not going to have that card. So my logic is, is part of the problem in that. So I'm not trying to be holier than vow by any stretch here. Yeah. But um, something needs to change there. I, I, I've, I've seen, I've seen a few things that are very questionable here. So let me ask you and to the general audience, if people think to yourself, would you still be high on collecting everything or cards in general if the numbering was just abolished? So I've, I've brought. That's a great question. Um, so yeah. that's a, I, I love this question. For myself, I have said a couple of things about collecting, and I'm kind of like yourself. I, nobody ever asks me my opinion about stuff on the podcast because they're here to talk about what they want to talk about. Sure. But um, I would never – I hate thick cards. I wish yeah. every card stock was 35 point. The day yeah. that they went away from that, they ruined the binder. They ruined – they brought in this idea that these cards were high end when it's the worst quality ever. It drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. 35 point, they never should have left it. Numbered cards, you know, if you want to stamp foiling on it, I'm, I, I totally understand that. And I collect them and I like them. If they had just stuck with the specials that they had in the 90s, where there was a, a three by three image that was hollow foiled, or there were yeah. four parallels of an insert, I would have been happy with that. Numbered cards, 
I don't really care for, but I collect them all except for one. Sure. Time. But I, 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 I collect them all. If they never came out, I would have never have missed them. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I would have probably still been collecting cards if they weren't, you know, numbered like that, because I look at it this way. Comics aren't like that. No, that's why, not. but that's why grading exists. So people can yeah. chase the highest. Yeah. Grading exists in cards. You can chase the highest. You can be one of the 10 people that has the, you know, Marvel Impel 90 universe, you know, 10, you know, gem mint 10 set, you know, yeah. but what numbering does and, and enlarge these comic cuts are part of that. They make it exclusive. They, you they know, do. it, it really knocks out so many people that could just enjoy ripping a box for 50 bucks, have all their characters, have the 180 card sets, the inserts. And if you want to do some numbering, do do like creator autograph numbers. I know? think the buyback should be numbered. I love that the buybacks, yeah, buybacks are, are cool. I think that's a great insert to have as a numbered one. But I hear what you're saying. I think that numbering things, it, it is enjoyable for people to chase numbered cards. But I'm just saying, had they have never numbered them, I would have never, I would never have missed it. Yeah, yeah. And let everybody have skin in the game. Let everybody be able to collect. I mean, I feel the same way about comics, you know. I I I don't exclusivity exclusivity is boring. It it's is boring. It it you know, and then then everybody can have a chat about this and you can the, the Marvel card community would grow in in exponentially if you started making everything affordable. You can put it in multiple stores. I mean, Graydon, I don't know if you remember, but I remember when I used to walk into comic stores and on the counter were boxes and packs and you could buy them. And it was like, it was like the, the candy at the grocery store, you know, yeah. you just grab a couple packs and throw it in with your books and boom. And now it's like, if you were to try and explain to people that have no idea, no idea that Marvel cards still exist, but they would buy them. If you tried to explain to people how you have to get them now. You yeah. would just it, people would just shut off and walk away. I think that I think you're right it's for a lot of people. For myself, of my channel, uh, especially in Canada, a lot of young families have reached out um, over the channel to ask how they get into collecting with their kid and sure. not destroy the bank because a lot yeah. of them live in very expensive Canadian cities. And there is a product that exists for that, and it's blaster boxes. Yeah, yeah. So people who are buying a $30 blaster box to open on a Friday night with their kids and have nine packs in there and all you're going to get is base and an insert and a couple fun chase cards, that does exist for, for people. I open lots of blaster boxes. I'm more than happy to and I, and I love it. But it is a choice to go after the hobby boxes and the numbered cards. And you can enjoy it by just doing the blaster boxes. It's less exciting and a lot of channels make you feel as though that's not good enough. And on my channel... It's a hundred percent good enough. Sure, that's, sure. That's a hundred percent good enough. If you're enjoying this and you're having the nostalgia when you were a kid with your family, now you're winning. You're you're a hundred percent winning. I'd I'd like to just refute a little bit of that with my own experience. Yeah. Okay. Blaster boxes. When Spider Man Metal came out, I actually had to buy them secondary because they were impossible to find. Oh, and at Walmart, you can buy them here in Canada. Like you, Walmart stocked. In the States, you can't. Um, and then I was like, oh, cool. It's a box. Six packs. I'm like, that's it? That's oh. it? Or whatever <laughs> it is. Like, I was just so disappointed by how much I didn't get. Uh, right. You know, I didn't care that I wasn't getting a comic. I Like, that I didn't care about. I'm just, I'm like, man, I used to go to Toys R Us. And you could buy boxes of whatever. They had full boxes. It, yeah. it just, it's like, I, I and I, I. I don't want to completely shit all over what you just said because you're right. No, it, no. Is a, it is a great way to get families and and you know people that don't have four hundred dollars you know to buy a box, but yeah. make it easier. Put more of them out there. Give yeah. people Perfect. more of a chance. And you know what? Here's the thing. From a corporate standpoint, if it doesn't work and you spend a year putting full hobby boxes in retail stores, it doesn't work. You know what you do? Go back to your old ways of, of making it exclusive again. But if it does work, holy shit, we just found another revenue stream to capitalize off of. Right. Corporations are going to corporate or whatever. But, you know. Money. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But make, fine, use people like me to make money by saying, oh, wow, I just went to Target and I just got a Marvel Masterpieces box for a hundred bucks and, and I came home and I opened it. And then you have me. 
the guy that won't talk about Marvel cards that much in this way, talking about Marvel cards on my channel. Right. So, you know. I, I don't see, like, on this topic, I don't see a lot of people um, from the comic world ever wanting to make the jump into Marvel cards. Like, the Marvel card niche is, is so much smaller than the uh, the comic world. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally think that it will it will always be that way. If if more people got into Marvel cards, then ten times more people got into comics that year. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? But you know, if you also try and gear towards people that if they win me over, that means you know, in that aspect, my peers will also be won over, and then everybody that watches will be yeah. won over. I mean, that's what me and Manu are trying to do. As much as I don't really. Like I said, collect cards. I'm happy to buy collections and sell them to people and not charge crazy money. But, you know, Manu's more of the point of like, I love this stuff so much and I want everybody else to love it. And I'm with him because at the end of the day, you know, when I look at these first four years of uh, or five years of Marvel cards, you have some of the best artists working on cards. You got yeah. Jusco, you got Eric Larson, you got Art Adams, you got Jim Lee. I mean, like, why or wouldn't I promote the hell out of it? Yeah. So. You know, I uh, I really appreciate having this conversation with somebody that um, that doesn't just want to promote all of this stuff because I you know I I'm a huge fan of a lot of these products and I, I think it's important to make sure people out there on the internet know that there are opposing views to these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are it's not all just perfect. No, I'm not all just yeah. I'm not all just daisies and yeah. I, I got it. my blinders on. You know, there's. The, the strategies that these companies use, I've I've been against for a long time because I was sucked into it at a young age and then spit out by it. And, you know, I'm wiping myself off. I'm like, oh, I'm dirty from all these numbered cards that I used to buy. <laughs> you know, I would like everyone who's watching this, if you want to drop some comments down below here with some questions or some input, we will do our very best to get back to you. I'll definitely get back to you if Dave yeah, chooses to, uh, to respond to yours as well. Um, if you guys have questions down there, let's like keep the conversation going. Let's uh, let's chat about it down there. Where we've covered what I wanted to cover. Um, one last thing I'd like to throw out there is uh, West Coast Dave Enders YouTube channel. I watch it frequently. If you're not watching it, you should get over there and subscribe. Great Thank channel. You. Thank you. Um, Todd McFarland was on it. In case you missed it, I mean, my God, maybe you've heard of Todd McFarland, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a moment for me, and also had Eric Larson. So two of the the Spider Man artists that I grew up with were both on my channel within a month. That's a thank big you. deal. That's a big big deal. Yeah. Um, so. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna wrap it up, and uh, I really hope that we can have another conversation again. Maybe do a box break or something. Yeah, great. And thank you for having me on. And uh, I'm excited to see if, you know, what, what people have to say about this. I mean, I, you know, I'm just going to keep being me and I'm, I, I love all this stuff. I love comics and comic art. So, you know, like people say, collect what you love, but know what you love before you start collecting. That's uh, that's wise advice from someone who's been in a hobby a long, long time. So you guys can uh, track down all of these podcasts on the channel here. You can look back and see the other episodes. We have conversations similar to this with lots of good input. Uh, thanks so much for joining everybody and uh, see you next time.